The turning point in history of most hometowns is economic. A factory moves in, or an industry moves in, and then thousands or millions of people follow. This episode is the story of a county in southern Indiana that was changed not through industry, but through art. It's the story of one well-known painter named T.C. Steele and his wife Selma, and how they almost single-handedly changed the future of Brown County and nearly every town within it. Today, everyone in Indiana knows Brown County, and many have visited at least once. When T.C. and Selma moved here more than a hundred years ago, few people had ever heard of it. And for those who had, it was treated as a running joke about backwards and out-of-the-way places. Multiple times now, I've visited this steel estate, and this time I brought the team with me to help share this history with you. Our guide throughout the property was Kate Wetzel, the program developer here at the T.C. Steel State Historic Site. What's important to know about this area is that when T.C. Steel settles here, it looks very different from the way it looks now. Because Brown County in 1907 is considered the ends of the earth. Nobody comes to Brown County. It has a national reputation, as does Steel. But Brown County's reputation is for being backwards. Because Abe Martin is a nationally syndicated cartoon. He looks like an Uncle Sam figure. He's like a line drawing in these tattered clothes. And he likes to spit out these folksy witticisms that people associate with Mark Twain. At some point, we're going to do something on Abe Martin. He deserves his own episode. You might think of him as a cross between Sunday comics and New Yorker cartoons. This fictional character was located in Brown County and became so popular that he was syndicated to more than 200 newspapers around the country, and collections of these cartoons were sold in book form. So here he is, this hill person from Brown County, Indiana, and everybody loves to laugh at Abe Martin. And so the rest of the state, really, certainly Indianapolis, but also Bloomington, have moved on from the Civil War. And at the turn of the century, we've got in Indianapolis and in Bloomington, more housing going up, development, advancement, progress, right? Not in Brown County. Brown County is 40 years behind Bloomington. And its people are living in log cabins consistent with the 1840s. So when T.C. Steele arrives here, everyone thinks he is nuts. But then the paintings of Brown County begin to appear. And everyone goes, that's Brown County, that's beautiful, we had no idea. If you're not from Indiana, you may not be aware of this, but Brown County is one of the state's most popular destinations. To this day, it has only one incorporated town, Nashville, which has a population of 800 people. In spite of this relatively tiny population, tourists spend roughly $45 million in Brown County every year. They finally discovered what T.C. knew all those years ago. And the thing about Brown County that made it spectacular were these geographic features, these rolling hills. When Steele stands, when you stand where you are now, when he would stand where you are, he could see all the way to Bloomington from here. Because the ridges are clear of trees. Brown County is clear cut. It's a farming community that's terrible to farm. That's the joke on Brown County. Because this county is made of the unwanted land of the four counties that surround it. So Bloomington is good to farm. Columbus is good to farm. Brown County is terrible. Has to do with a very thin topsoil, and underneath it, if you're on the tilt, it's bedrock. If you're down toward the county seat, Nashville, it's red clay, which might explain why we have three potteries in the village of Nashville during the 1930s. But what people are doing here is they're living in these log cabins, 10 or more kids on average, and everybody is surviving. These are subsistence farming families. And Steele arrives and he builds this house on top of a hill. Nobody does that. Everybody builds in the hollows, right? He stains it red, a color exclusively reserved for barns. 
He fills it with paintings and music. The 20th century touches down for the first time in, in Brown County when the House of Singing Winds is built. And this is the only place in the county to hear recorded music. So people come to visit. They're not sure they like the Steels. They're considered foreigners from Indianapolis. Who marries a man who paints all day? Who marries a woman who can't cook? Who are these people? Selma Steele is 35 years old. Her husband is 60. It's her first marriage. It's his second marriage. And this is supposed to be the honeymoon house. And people come to visit, unannounced and uninvited. They walk up this hill seven days a week to see the house. When we arrived at the House of the Singing Winds, I was already inspired by what I knew of T.C. Steele. By the time I left, I think I was actually more inspired by his wife, Selma Steele, a strong-willed artist in her own right. In a real sense, this house and this property are her masterpiece. Selma Steele was the first generation of American girl as we know her in Indiana. By that I mean... She's a daughter of immigrants, Austrian-American. First language is German. Her parents insist that the girls be as educated and independent as the boys, which means that they all go to school, and they are all encouraged to have their own hobbies. But when they finish high school, everyone's expected to graduate. They get married or they get a job. Selma gets a job teaching in the public schools in Indianapolis. After a few years of that, she decides that she wants a degree. She takes herself to the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York, and takes a degree in normal art, which is the teacher's degree. Comes home to teach art at the Heron School, the first real art school in Indianapolis. Brant Steele, T.C.'s oldest, is her colleague. She's friends with Daisy Steele, T.C. Steele's daughter. And she is teaching teachers how to teach art on Sundays. But she holds on to her job with the public schools. So by the time she's 35, Salma Neubacher is assistant superintendent of art in the city schools of Indianapolis. This is at a time when women don't vote. They don't control property, even if they own it. And they have no legal rights or access to their own children if their husbands decide on separation or divorce. And Salma Neubacher can design the entire art curriculum for the Indianapolis school system. There she is right over there. This is her house. Portrait of Selma Steele, painted by her husband, T.C. Steele. She's in an ostrich feather hat. Lovely woman, auburn hair. Big fan of the opera. She's a, we'd call her probably an NPR subscriber today. The thing that makes this house spectacular from our point of view today is that we are almost completely original. Having been in countless historic buildings, I can tell you how rare that is. Most houses of this kind are filled with either replacement or reproduction furnishings. Little but the actual structure tends to be original. In the House of the Singing Winds, on the other hand, even the books on the shelves and the half-used paint tubes on the desks once belonged to the steels. I can tell you just about everything in this home was an artifact belonging to the Steels, which is pretty remarkable when you consider that most historic homes have pieces from the period but not belonging to the family. We get to be original like this because Selma Steele gave us everything that was hers right before she died in 1945 through deed of gift to the people in the state of Indiana. So 350 paintings, 211 acres, all of the buildings and their contents. Caretakers came in to look after the home. They lived here with Selma's little sister, Edith, who had life rights until her own death. So what we see here really is has not been tracked down. It was what the Steels lived with. This is your Goodwill furniture of 1907. This is Victorian furniture, and the Queen died in 1901. So this had six years to go out of fashion in Indianapolis. Selma picks it up cheap. Now, T.C. Steele was born in 1847. He's a child of the Victorian period. And I know that, you know, Victoria is not an American queen. The tastes of Victorian England, really the taste of England and France, come across to American households, and we copy them. So during Steele's lifetime, this is a style of furniture probably that would have been considered comfortable and familiar. Selma picks it up cheap. They bring it out to the summer house. The neighbors come to see the furniture. 
Not because they like Victoriana, but because it is factory made. And all the furniture in Brown County is made by hand. Then you've got the paintings on the walls. The neighbors are not terribly impressed with the paintings. Painting is an easy job. Farming is what's hard work. But the Victrola and the player piano. This is a very musical area. There are fiddle contests on the porches at night, but nobody has a way to play music in their home. I noticed a large peacock mounted on the side of the room. It stood on a tall black stand, roughly six feet tall, with its feathers trailing down to the ground. Yes, they had a peacock. This is not the original peacock. The original peacock was embalmed with arsenic which is how taxidermy was done. So anyone offers you Civil War taxidermy, just say no, full of heavy metals to preserve it. I'm told by collections that, you know, short of hugging a taxidermied peacock embalmed with arsenic, it really wouldn't be a danger to you, but I don't know. (laughs) I think it's best that we have another one. But the stuffed peacock was a common element in Victorian homes. I like to imagine going to Target and going through an aisle of like goldfinches just putting one in the cart. People had taxidermied specimens in their house. It was decor. But the peacock I love here because it has one function, which is to be pretty. And when you think about a Brown County log cabin, a Brown County farming family, here is a dead bird in the house and you can't even eat it. So the, <laughs> it's just a perfect example of, I think, the steals in Brown County is that this is worth keeping because it is beautiful. It doesn't have to have a utility. But everything in a log cabin would have had a use. If it was beautiful, it would also have been functional in some way. It occurred to me that this peacock symbolized a broader shift in the way people viewed Brown County as a whole. Remember, it was made of the lands that other counties didn't want because those lands were useless. They had no utility. They were poor farmland. But today, people love Brown County. It's one of the most cherished counties in the state of Indiana. Why? Because it's beautiful. Back to the tour. The paintings on the walls all are original T.C. Steel pictures, oil on canvas, with the exception of the pictures they collected, but were not done by him. And this is the first kitchen. It was a terrible kitchen. T.C. Steele designed this house. He never used the kitchen, and so this was a kitchen which had a number of problems. When Selma walks up this hill in her wedding shoes in 1907, remember also that she is a professional artist, educator, and administrator. She's not a cook either. She makes the assumption that we all make when we move to a new place. One, there will be water. Two, there will be a grocery store. And three, if I need help in my house, I can hire it. And the answer to all three is wrong. There is no water on this hill. There is no grocery store anywhere nearby. And Brown County neighbors will not trust their daughters to work for the Steels. They're considered foreigners, artists. They're not from here. Daughters who work in-house usually live in-house. These are who do we don't know who these people are. We don't know what they'll see in this home. No, they may not work for you. And now suddenly it's Selma's job to figure out what are we going to eat, what are we going to drink, how are we going to live. Because in Brown County in 1907, if you don't shoot it or grow it, you don't eat it. T.C. Steele is not a hunter. Gardens take a while to grow. Mrs. Steele plants flowers. Neighbors tell her it is vain and foolish and feminine to plant flowers. She should be planting food. They're not wrong about the food part, but Selma basically says... I plant flowers. My husband puts my flowers in the pictures. We sell the pictures. This is land use. And the neighbors are glad to have that explanation because otherwise they can't figure out what the Steels are doing here. Who buys a farm and doesn't farm it? In 1907, in Brown County. But the problem with food is a challenge which will endure. Selma Steele discovers when she gets here that the store at the bottom of the hill is a dry goods store which has meat in a barrel. And that's it. She's told when she comes out with her grocery list, butter, cheese, fruits, vegetables, bread, everybody makes their own. So there she is. So they end up going to Bloomington at the beginning to fill up the wagon. They come back here. This is what we would call today a food desert. There's no place to go and buy fresh food. Two artists living on top of a hill in a so-called food desert 
resulted in a very predictable outcome. Lots of really terrible food. Barely edible meals that involved eating unburned scrapings from the bottom of the pan. In the corner of the turquoise-colored dining room is a small closet full of cups and plates. It doesn't look like much, but people came from all over the county to look at it. She makes things on the stove. They refer to things that come out of the stove as steel's mixtures. She gets herself a better stove pretty quickly, converts this into the dining room, takes down the wall, glasses in the porch, cuts a hole in the wall and makes the first built-in closet in Brown County. Everyone says she's going to ruin a good plaster wall. She says, I don't think you heard me. I'm cutting a hole in this wall. That's me imagining what her what she would say. But then the neighbors all come to see the closet because it's the first built-in closet in Brown County. It's a miracle. You open the wall, you put things inside, things you don't need right now, and then you close the wall. So there'd be a voice in the driveway. So we're here to see the closet, and in comes the whole wagon. Granny and everyone see the closet. Closets were taxed as extra rooms in a home. So if you go into these beautiful old houses and you open the closet, you can put a shoebox in there sideways. There were rules about the dimensions that a closet could be before it became another room. I know. It's totally bizarre. When you see these old houses and you're like, let's take a look at the closets first. Okay, okay. (laughs) Because the storage situation, also, we have many more things than our our ancestors ever did, even a 100 years ago. More things to put away. And here you see the changing room. There was no bathroom in this house. They would have had an outhouse. What we're looking at is a small room centered on the large open back of the brick fireplace. It's really a brilliant place to put a changing room for a house without modern heating. Kate will explain that in a moment. But this area would be where you needed, if you needed to take a tub, you'd haul the bathtub in here, you'd fill it with water from the cistern that you would have heated on the stovetop, dumped it into the tub, and then hauled it all outside again. This is also probably where you would use a chamber pot in the middle of the night. You'll see it's on the other side of the fireplace, so it'd be a nice warm room in spring and fall to get changed in the morning. Not only was Selma a creative homemaker, she had a knack for turning a profit. She was charging people a quarter when they came up here and wanted to walk around because she still had to pay her taxes. And she had it in mind already that she was going to leave this place as a memorial to her husband's legacy. But she watched as people who did not pay their taxes lost everything. So, very lean widowhood for her to keep this place together because she didn't want to sell any of the paintings. She did sell some to IU at the beginning. But she was very careful to try and keep as much of this together as possible, including the entire acreage, 211, because the Steels also believed in the beauty of nature and the importance of conservation. You can't get the trees back once you cut them all down. And the development, especially the rapidity that people were spreading through this country and doing it a lot faster than everyone anticipated, which led to this interest in the preservation of the national parks, and then the state parks followed suit. These ideas that if we didn't buy this land and keep it in trust and protect it, it wouldn't be there, which was, I think, very careful thinking. So at the beginning, when the steels get here, there's no water. There's a little creek and water the horse there, but it's not enough. And so the, bo- the steels hire boys. I think the Parks family, I think their sons, bring water from the bottom of the hill every day. Two boys, two buckets, two miles up from the Salt Creek. And when you think about it, two buckets for two adults in the summertime, you're just going to drink it. There's not going to be anything left for washing, bathing, anything else. So Selma Steele says, we need more water. T.C. Steele says, maybe we're using too much water. Selma says, we don't get more water. I'm not coming back. So a cistern is dug, and that collects the rainwater on the eaves. So if you go out and look at our gutters on the house, they'll look a little different. They are for collecting rainwater, and they did pool in several places around the property. You could pump that water up and use it for washing and bathing. And of course, you could also drink it if you needed to. Salt Creek was the closest freshwater source. As you might expect, Selma insisted on having one of the earliest refrigerators in Brown County. 
but for many years, the steels relied on a root cellar built directly under the home, which was also highly unusual for this area. And this is a big deal. Because the Brown County ladies have root cellars in fields. They have to go outside in all kinds of weather to go to a hole in the ground and pull out food for their family of 12. Can you imagine? And you can't make anything fresh because it's all going to spoil. So nobody makes extra. If the ladies accidentally make more butter than they need, Mrs. Steele will come over and buy it from them because they'll sell it knowing that they can't use it and it's going to go to waste. But nobody is going to sell food out of their family's mouths. So it's only when an accident like that happens that Mrs. Steele will get the benefit of it. But this root cellar, Selma Steele asked for two things in this house. One, a large open fireplace. She liked them a lot. They were out of fashion. Two, a root cellar accessible through the home. I think that's a very moderate list considering what I would be asking for if I was moving to the middle of nowhere with my artist husband. Leaving the kitchen... I asked Kate for the source of the name for the House of the Singing Winds. She walked us around to the sleeping porch in the back of the house to explain. It was named by Selma Steele, and it was designed to be a four-room summer bungalow, living room, bedroom, changing room, kitchen, wrapped three-quarters way around by screen porches, and the screens are metal. So when the wind would come roaring up the hill, no trees to get in the way. It would hit those metal screens, they would vibrate like guitar strings, and the house would sing. And that's how it takes its name, the house of the singing winds. It was also the fashion at the time to give your summer house a cute name. And this one stuck. Traditionally, painters have worked indoors with paints they mixed in bowls for that very moment. Painting was a very stationary activity. In the 1800s, manufacturers began selling paint in pre-mixed tubes, and this changed everything. Most importantly, these tubes were portable. At any moment, you could grab your tubes of paint and go. You might compare this revolution in painting to the difference between listening to music on a turntable and listening to it on your iPhone, or if you're really old, on a Walkman. Nobody ever went for a jog listening to music on a record on their turntable. As soon as painting became portable, painters did a very predictable thing. They went outside. And with so many tubes of premixed paint at their disposal, they painted fast and they painted recklessly. Painting became fun again and exciting again. And you didn't need a big fancy studio to do it. This form of painting out in the open air became known as plein air painting. That's basically just a French phrase that means outdoors. T.C. Steele was one of the major American champions of this new style. We'll get back to the tour now, but I wanted you to have that background for some of what Kate will be referring to over the next few minutes. Over here? The study, the last room we visit in the home. And this is T.C. Steele's study. This is where he's going to do all of his writing. So as a plein air landscape painter, on a day like today, on most days, T.C. Steele would be outside in all kinds of weather. Plein air painters, especially painters who work with oils, are geared up and ready for just about anything out there because they paint on location. And they don't paint from memory or photograph, at least Steele did not paint from a photograph. So he would have been outside, but on days where he had to do correspondence, where he had lectures, essays, articles for the newspaper, this is the thing about Mr. Steele. When he comes here, he's a public man. People come up here like they know him. They send him letters, they come to visit, they ask, they come for commissions, and they enter this home as if they have every right to be <laughs> entering a private residence. When the large studio is built, it will become gallery, showroom, and essentially where Mr. Steele can hold court as needed in there. But when he is in here, he can write letters to his children. He has three grown children and a number of grandchildren, and nobody lives in Brown County. They're all married, and they've got families of their own elsewhere. 
This is also where we see with his essays and articles and lectures, he is the first artist in residence at Indiana University. He was appointed to the position by William Lowe Bryan, university president in 1922. And he holds that position until his death in 1926. These chandeliers came out of a Montgomery Ward catalog. Selma Steele hired an electrician to wire the house, and she ran her electricity, including that refrigerator, on a generator in the basement. It has glass batteries, because Brown County doesn't get electricity until the 1940s. I want you to imagine standing in your log cabin with your 10 children around you and looking up this hill and seeing warm electric light coming out of this house, a palace for two people, and asking yourself, what else can the 20th century do? We stepped outside of the house, and on the walk to the studio, Kate shared more about why she finds the House of the Singing Winds so compelling. Historic homes are all surface. Everything in the house, with the exception of the paintings, does not do what it's supposed to do. The couches will not be sat upon, the books will not be read. No one is sleeping in those beds anymore. And so when I look at that house, it is to me a house in amber, undisturbed. As we enter, the studio feels a bit like a clean, open plan barn. So Steele did use it as a studio. However, as a landscape painter and a plein air painter, when he's doing that kind of work, he's outside. When he's doing still life painting, he'll be doing it in here, probably. And he'll be doing the other work of painting, too. So today, if you wanted to paint a plein air masterpiece, you could go to Michael's and get yourself a pre-stretched canvas, which is already on its boards, and just ready for you to paint it. But when T.C. Steele was doing this, he probably would have had to stretch his own canvas, build his own frames, or at least have the frames ordered and then be stretching the canvas over them. He then would have had to gesso them and prepare them for the oil paint, because if he didn't do that, the paint would go straight through, wouldn't stay on it. Then, when the painting's done and sufficiently dry, he'll have to varnish it, which means he'll probably be mixing his own varnish from a number of different bottles here and applying it and letting it dry. So there are a number of stops (laughs) in the painting process. Today, we've streamlined it quite a bit. Mr. Steele doesn't have to make his own paint. Paint is now available in these adorable little tubes that you can mail order and get almost everything that way. But artists of earlier periods, painters ground their own pigments and made their own paints. And they also studied geometry and chemistry, other things, as well as basically biology and anatomy in order to be painting the way that they did. Steele was the premier portrait painter in the state of Indiana by the time of his death in 1926 when he is sent to Germany by the business community of Indianapolis, the Germans of Indianapolis, sponsor his education at the Royal Academy of Munich, which is to do one thing, portraiture, in the style of the old masters. This is German realism. This is what people want to buy. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with this kind of language art, realism is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. Making things look realistic. The idea, really, is to get as close as you can to a photograph. And when it comes to realism, Steele has natural genius. His ability to paint human faces and expressions is amazing. But he's bored with that. He falls in love with a new style of painting called Impressionism. Rather than trying to paint things photographically, Impressionism is all about capturing a sense of what it feels like to encounter those things in real life. The impressions they give. Because of how fleeting an impression can be, this style of painting happens quickly. In short, blunt brush strokes of unmixed colors. As you might guess, one of the most common subjects for Impressionism is landscape. Steele falls in love with landscape when he's in Germany. He's not the only American over there. There are a number of young American painters, and they are painting landscape for fun in their free time. And that is when T.C. Steele discovers that this is the work he loves. 
which is too bad because this is what Americans want to buy. This is what everybody in Indiana wants to buy. Kate's pointing to a pair of portraits hanging on the wall of the studio. One of them is Steele's own son, Rembrandt, or Brandt for short. It might not seem like a big deal, but Indiana landscape is not being painted very often. I think you can probably think about why. Any ideas? When Kate asked this question, I honestly didn't know the answer either. I figured one landscape was as good as another. Who's going to buy it? If you live in Indiana, why do you need a painting of Indiana? If you don't live in Indiana, why do you want a painting of Indiana? If you have any money for a painting, it's going to be a portrait of a loved one. The camera has been invented. The Civil War, fortunately, the, those, the, all those young soldiers went off and got their picture made. But we know that daguerreotypes and tintypes are not going to go behind the desk of the bank president. We also know that they don't last forever. Portraits last forever. If you have a beautiful husband or a, a handsome family, you get that painted. And T.C. Steele, as a child, knows that the only painters who make a life, who make a living to support a family, are portrait painters. You're looking at all the paintings in here that nobody wanted to buy. Now, some of these wouldn't have been for sale. For example, Brant's portrait over here, that was something that he had, which was passed down to his children, and has only just lately come back to us. So not everything in this room would have been on the walls in 1926 when Mr. Steele died and part of Selma Steele's estate. But a lot of it was. Mrs. Steele, Selma Steele left us everything. She knew that she wanted to leave a museum. She called it a memorial. And she saved paintbrushes, the cigar butts, which are back there in the ashtray, the used paint tubes, the palettes, the varnishes. T.C. Steele was a smoker of cigars. You look around and you see all the different cigar boxes. The House of the Singing Winds isn't just a memorial to the lives and legacies of T.C. and Selma Steele. It's a tribute to a turning point in the history of Brown County. It also represents something of a turning point for the way the rest of the country viewed the state of Indiana as a whole. When he lived in downtown Indianapolis, following his return from Germany, his home at 16th and Pennsylvania Street, the Tinker Talbot Place home, become, is his Indiana School of Art. He opens his studios on the weekends and invites people to come in, which is really the first time probably a lot of people in Indiana get to see fine art of Indiana on the walls. In fact, Steele is painting these landscapes of Indiana at a time when no one cares and no one is buying. Eager to promote the growing Hoosier art scene, T.C. collaborated with other German-trained Hoosier Impressionists, like William Forsyth and Otto Stark, on a large art show in downtown Indianapolis. And these guys get a show in downtown Indianapolis showing off Indiana landscape, and it's a hit. The city turns out to see it. It's so big, in fact, so successful, that they decide to send some of those paintings up to the Columbian Exposition of 1893, which is what we'd call the World's Fair. And Steele exhibits at the World's Fair, which is really what gets a lot of attention back to this state, is to say, oh, there are painters in Indiana. Look what they can do. These guys are from Indiana. It's a pretty, it's a pretty big deal with that. So his star continues to ascend, and this is also one of the things I love about this story. Most artist stories we tell are sad stories, where there's a lack of recognition, there are troubles along the way, stories of weakness or failure or the, kind of the inability to cope with fame. And T.C. Steele manages a fairly even keel all the way through. He gets up in the morning at 4 a.m. He says a landscape painter has no business being in bed after 4 a.m. in the summertime. He's at work at 5. We're told he paints every day of his life until the last week of his life. And he is considered the dean of the art colony of the Midwest, of the Brown County Art Colony, because he doesn't invite people here. They come because he's here. He acts as a magnet for this area. 
artists come to Brown County and they set up for what they think is going to be the summer in downtown Nashville. And then many decide to stay and they make it a permanent residence. And the Brown County Art Colony is so successful that Eleanor Roosevelt will go shopping in the galleries of Nashville. During her husband's presidency, we have photographs of her coming out of a gallery with paintings under her arms. So it's not a cute little thing, it's a big deal. And what's really amazing about it, of course, is that the art story of Indiana is a, it's really a fascinating one, but nobody really tells it because it's not one of the stories that Indiana really chooses to tell about itself. But there's a lot here for people who want to look. So much of the best history works this way. It's right there in front of you if you take the time to look. Fortunately, we're lucky enough in this case to be able to do that. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Thank you.